Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome everybody to another episode of Celebrating Act 2. How are you doing, John? Good, good. Uh, I'm excited today, Art, as I know all our guests will, our, our viewers will, because our guest is a woman who is a noted educator, TV host, documentary filmmaker, speaker, and an author. But what's interesting is she didn't start out to do any of that. What happened? How did she? How did her life take a twist to, to all of a sudden become a whole new person? And that's what we're going to find out from Dr. Angela Sadler Williamson. Welcome, Angela. Hi, Angela. Hi there. Hi, Art and John. Thank you so much for having me. I this is such an honor. Our pleasure. Now you were referred to us by Manny Pacheco. Yes. Because he was on your television show. You have you have your own television show in Los Angeles called Everybody with Dr. Angela Sadler Williamson. How did that come about? It is the funniest story. <laughs> Um, now, a lot of your viewers may even have heard of this name. If they haven't heard of this name, they've heard the voice, Bill Rogers. And Bill Rogers is actually the voice of Disney when we all used to go to Disneyland and listen and wait for the parades. And we heard this phenomenal voice, and that was Bill Rogers. And Bill Rogers, I've known Bill Rogers for well over uh, 25 years. And... Um, in the middle of June, he contacted me and told me that he was working with a former production manager from PBS SoCal, who's now at KLCS, PBS in Los Angeles, and they want to do a new interview show. And they uh, want to change a little bit of how it looks. But when he told me this, I just thought he wanted me to be his guest. And I'm thinking, wow, this is wonderful because I had just come out with, you know, my first time being an author by myself and I just come out with this um, children's book and I thought, wow, this would be a great, great way. PBS, I could talk about my children's book. But as he continued to talk to me and he was telling me how they want just a different look, then he said, yeah, we were thinking that we want a different type of host. We're thinking maybe a woman. I said, oh, that's great. He's like, yeah, maybe a, a woman, like a person of color. And I'm like, well, hey, you know, that sounds even better. <laughs> like, what are you thinking about, Bill? <laughs> He's like, uh, you know, you're a little slow on the uptake, kid. <laughs> but they were thinking about me. And, and I was just completely blown away because um, – as you know, because you have worked a lot behind the scenes too, you know, there, there's a reason why we choose to be behind the scenes and we love it. We love the creativity of it. And so, you know, for Bill asking me to actually be in front of the camera, that was a huge leap of faith. But I think um, as we start to mature and doors start to open for us, I think sometimes we have to consider a lot if we want to take those take those chances so i took that chance because i completely trust bill i've known him for you know almost over three decades um i have worked with ty before when he was at pbs socal we worked on an internship program to, together i knew that he is just incredibly talented when it comes to production video production so i took a chance and started the show and one of the first uh, set of guests that I reached out to was Manny, because even though I never met Manny in person, our careers have, have crossed paths so many times over the years that I knew that he was such a great storyteller and I knew he was doing great things. And so I wanted him on the show and he came out and his interview was phenomenal. Well, you know, like that's that I was going to say you you mentioned uh, opening doors and, and taking advantage of them. But that's the story of your life. You originally had none of this. You didn't, you weren't an author, didn't have any idea you'd ever do a TV show. No. And here you are. Where did it all begin? When you got out of school, what were you doing? What was the first half of your life like? The first half of my life, luckily, I, I mean, I am so fortunate because I graduated with a bachelor's degree in communications, TV, radio, and film from Cal State Fullerton. 
And it's, I think it's one of the most phenomenal uh, communication programs for a state school. I mean, compared to USC, UCLA, I mean, we have some phenomenal colleges here and universities, but um, one of the things that a lot of my professors told me was in this business, sometimes you may have to start out outside of California because California is such a large market. And, and he, you know, and it, it was actually true for a lot of my friends who wanted to be broadcast journalists, but they say, even if you want to be behind the scenes, you may have to leave California. Well, luckily for me, um, I was involved at Cal State Fullerton in a number of programs. And because I was involved, uh, we learned a lot about the wonderful services that Cal State Fullerton offered. And, and at the time it was a career center. And a few days after I graduated, I went into the career center and in, inside this binder that was a, a communications binder, there was a job posting for a small cable station, the Orange County News Channel, which was located inside the Orange County Register building, and they were looking for a production assistant. And luckily I had had an internship that was with an independent producer. So all the qualifications that they were looking for um, I had, I mean, back then it was tape duplication, anything you were doing as a production assistant. But also I had a part-time job as a receptionist answering phones and they wanted an office type of a production assistant. So I figured, you know what, let me just apply. And I applied, got the interview um, because of all of the great things that I learned and picked up at Cal State Fullerton. I walked into that interview prepared and literally within two weeks after graduating, I was working full time as a production assistant. I did not have to leave California. I did not even have to leave the county that I went to school in. I could drive <laughs> right down the 57. And so, um, I mean, you talk about open doors. Now I look back at it. It was definitely an open door that... Um, I was just, I know it really changed how my life would be the next few, the next 20 plus years that would follow it. Well, it's kind of interesting well, that um, I know that you have a degree in uh, uh, an undergraduate in communications, marketing communications, and uh, you continue to pursue that for a good 15, 20 years. Maybe you could give us a quick recap of that because you went, even, went on and even got a master's in, I uh, did. In the, so could you give us a, like a, a recap of, of the kinds of things that you did uh, uh, in uh, communications? Yes. You know, the reason I went back, Art, to get that master's is that literally a year after I was working for the Orange County News Channel, they the Orange County Register sold it to a, a cable company called Century Communications. They don't they do not exist today. But at the time, they offered tuition um, reimbursement. And that was really not very, I mean, it was kind of unheard of in um, the, the mid-90s because that, that wasn't really a perk. But because it was a perk, and I've been thinking about going back because in the back of my mind, I, I always appreciated all of my professors that someday I wanted to be them and my way to give back to the next generation because I felt they had poured so much into me. But um, with Century Communications buying the Orange County News Channel and offering that tuition reimbursement, I taught my friend, um, Caroline Janik Wong, who is also an educator and she, she works for the Orange County Register today. But I talked her into, I said, let's go back to school together and have the company pay for it. And so we went back and we got our master's. She got her, she got hers, an MBA in marketing. I went back and got my master's in mass communications um, and we did it together. So it's always important in your path, whenever your path changes to find that buddy that you can support because even today, she mentions to people, I would not have my MBA if Angela didn't talk me into it. But she doesn't realize I could not have pursued that without having her because we, you know, we met on a Saturday and wrote our applications together, even though we were applying to two different departments. So I think that's so important in our journey that when we can find someone to go and be with us on that journey, it makes that journey so much better. So I went back and, and got the master's still was working in 
communications. At that point, I turned more into marketing communications because um, in the late 90s, we had this new thing called the internet. And a lot of people <laughs> were trying to, to find their business on the internet. And because I was a copywriter and more of a, what we call it, like a consumer copywriter, I was hired by Experian to help them launch their online credit reports online. In fact, some of the articles I wrote, they they updated it, but a lot of those articles I wrote on creditexpert.com are still there. So I was able to change and move into marketing communications. But like Art said, there there came a time in my life that I needed to do, um, I needed to start my act two. And, and that was in my early 30s when um, my son was born, but he was like a few years after he was born, I was thinking I needed to change the pace. And, and one of the ways I had always thought I would change my pace is that I would one day become a college professor and not just any college professor. I wanted to be a community college professor. Well, that's wow. Great. Now that was a turning point, obviously getting married, having a child is a big change yeah. in anybody's life, but the decision to actively go back and go into education from television, communications, promotions, marketing into education, that was a big turning point. That and, was a big choice. Let's make no mistake about it. You're now a successful young woman with a career, and you've even decided to uh, uh, do more than a lot of people do. You went back and got a, a master's, even though you were doing well, uh, but you got an advanced degree. And then, so you're constantly reinventing yourself. And I think that's probably one of the key messages here is that, uh, as you said, you, if you see an opportunity, Take a look at that opportunity. There's no reason why you can't keep doing that. And so uh, uh, your path to becoming a uh, college professor uh, was motivated by the fact that you wanted to spend some more time with your son, uh, yes. as well as uh, uh, a lifelong dream that you've had since, co since your community college days when you were inspired by teachers. So uh, maybe talk a little bit more about um, uh, the transition to becoming a professor. And then you did some interesting things along the way as well with that. But <laughs> So maybe we can uh, start out with, um, uh, how did you get your first teaching job and, and, uh, and what did that lead to? Okay. Yeah, I mean, because the, the journey, this journey, it, I am saying that it's all, I almost see an end in sight, um, but this journey is, basically been my longest journey to become a, a full-time um, you know, assistant or associate professor. When I decided to um, start to go into education, I wanted to become, the first step is an adjunct instructor. And I had been applying for a couple of years, but it never heard anything because I didn't have the experience. Well, what happened was I had, um, I went through and saw, I saw a job at College of the Desert. And at this time I am working full time as a marketing sales producer at Fox 11. And it's not just Fox 11, it's, 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 it's one position, but I'm working for four stations. I'm working for Fox 11, I'm working for My Network TV, uh, which they had just changed that to My Network TV. I'm working for Fox Sports West and Prime Ticket. So I'm working for all four stations doing their marketing sales promotions, working directly under sales. And I see this job at College of the Desert in Palm Desert. Now, yes, that does seem far, but for me, it's actually I, it's the same amount of time to drive there than which for me to drive to LA because of where I live. And they're looking for a person to teach introduction to mass media. And so I apply because I've been applying off and on for years, but I apply and the Dean calls me to come in for an interview. And so I'm like, wow. And so I drive out there. I'm like, oh my God, this is such a dull drive <laughs> because it's just straight the 10 freeway, 10 freeway all the way down there. But you know, there's no traffic. So I get down there and I meet with the Dean and he says, you know, you're the only person to call me back. Look at this, you know, your background looks great. You're working at Fox. And he said, you can, and the class was like one night a week. I was thinking maybe it was a Monday night. 
And I was so excited. So with that open door, even though it was really far, it was only one class, I was going to do that. But then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, I've got to keep my full-time job because this isn't what I was thinking. You start off like you start off in the industry. You start off as a production assistant, part-time, not making it. And I'm like, I can't afford to do that. I'm in, I'm in my mid-30s at this point. So um, I get the job and um, the marketing manager at Fox 11 um, finds out and um, if anybody knows it's a little bit stressful to work in this industry it's a lot stressful if you're a woman working this industry especially working with other women because it's highly competitive and it doesn't really create an environment where you work together and um, she says to me she says well I think this is a conflict of interest and I'm like me teaching I mean because I had I had professors come in all the time who worked full time in the industry and that's where I, I actually got my best knowledge. And so um, she said, yeah, I think it's a conflict of interest and I want to take you to HR. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I mean, it, it wasn't, and at that point there was a lot of other stuff happening, but I, I came home and I talked to my husband and I said, I finally, I finally able to get my foot in the door to start, start teaching. I know it's one class, but I mean, how long would it take? It's not going to take me that long. You know, I know how to, you know, keep my head down and, and go with the grind because television teaches you that. And he said, you know what, if this is something you want to do and everything, um, you know, just give you a notice at Fox, you know, because he said, you know, her taking you to HR, that that's just, that, that's not, because that's not right. There's something more there. And so, so basically what I did was I went into Fox, put in my two week notice and, um, <laughs> and basic and, and did that in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, Oh, it's, it's, it's going to take me maybe a year or two. I'll become a, a, an associate professor by then. But that wasn't the case. It wasn't the case. Um, I would in within a year, I would get a couple more teaching jobs. So that was wonderful, but they were all still part time. I'm teaching one class, Probably I'm teaching one class at College of the Desert. Eventually, it ended up to two classes. How exciting! But I had two classes, then had one class at the University of Laverne, then had one class at Fullerton College, then Concordia University called me, and then Concordia University is the university that started offering me more classes. But I'm still an adjunct, and so one of the 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 one of the conclusions that I came to was. Um, maybe I needed to go back and get my doctorate. And, and at the same time, that's my husband was like, yeah, this seems to be the way to go. And so what I did was I started to pursue my doctorate. But what I wouldn't realize is that um, a journey that I thought would only take me a few years to accomplish would take me a total of 14 years. Wow. wow. Yes, 14 years. And so okay. in that 14 years, um, I would have to learn to reinvent myself over and over again because I'm literally working part time. And so one of the ways that I learned to reinvent myself again was in my mid 40s when it all emotionally started cra crashed down on me because I'm feeling this, you know, I'm going through my own little midlife crisis because I'm still not an uh, assistant or associate professor. Um, and I now have finished um, getting my doctorate and I'm still working part time. And so at the same time, my father-in-law passes away. And when he passes away, I do a memorial video and realize there's so much that I did not know about my father-in-law and then reached out to my husband again and said, you know, maybe it's time for us to capture your family's legacy and because I, my aunt was staying with me and I was learning so much about her relationship with Rosa Parks, I said, maybe what I need to do is since I'm not full time anywhere, I can choose my own research. Maybe I need to do a documentary on your family's legacy. And he was like, he's like, again, he's like, yeah, I'd much rather just support you in these endeavors it is, instead of watching you go downhill. And so basically Art and John, when I made that decision to produce this documentary, um, it would entirely, it would change my life entirely into what you are all seeing today. I mean, yeah, it looks yeah. like all the other stuff started coming really quickly, but you're, you're talking, this was almost 10 years into a journey that I just, I was not able 
to move and advance myself career-wise one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. And, and like they say, like they say in, show in show business, business. An, overnight an overnight success. success. <laughs> It, yeah, well, oh. well, well, we know it's an overnight success that takes like a decade and a half. <laughs> yeah. So just as a, 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 a quick tie together for our audience, uh, your uh, husband's family, uh, you in effect became a, uh, what, a, a probably a second cousin or a, uh, of uh, Rosa Parks. Uh, so th that, that's a connection to that. And you did a documentary. And uh, it uh, uh, w went into the film circuit, so on and so forth. But perhaps uh, the, the most interesting to date reinvention of yourself was that I know that you went on a speaking tour. And so here you are, you're already, you've got your doctorate. Uh, I think by, by now you're an adjunct professor uh, uh, or, or higher. And uh, you're- I'm still adjunct. <laughs> but, 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 but you're definitely uh, locked into a lot of things dealing with your education. You've got this documentary and you're out on a speaking tour. And there's another reinvention that happens because you were you were on a speaking tour and normally you would show the film, but you also want a speaking tour to elementary school kids. And then what did that happen? What happened because of that? Well, um, I always, in the beginning, this documentary was actually re-edited for the film festival circuit. So the very first version of this documentary is for educators. So in educators with each segment, uh, maybe not all of them, but most of them, there are discussion prompts. And so when I re-edited it for the film festival circuit and started going places, a second grade uh, teacher who I went to high school with she asked me to come and speak to her second grade class in Diamond Bar. And, and, but I'm like, well, I can't show them a 64 minute documentary. <laughs> I like, That's a, a disaster in the making. And so I decided to show them the one scene of all four generations of Rosa Parks family on the original bus. And that's about four minutes. And they, and they watched this, they watched the segment. I then asked them, to pull out their crayons and draw me a picture of the bus and tell me like what they thought about it. And when, when they're, they are done, that is what I, what I call one of my aha moments is that, you know, and I love using things from Oprah because I love Oprah. Um, but I was thinking, wow, okay, so this, this segment, I can show this to elementary school children, but they need something else. So in the back of my mind, I was always thinking about writing something for elementary school children, but I didn't know what I would write until I took my documentary to Iowa Wesleyan University in March 2019. And one of the ladies in the audience who heard my story came up to me at the end of the entire, because I was there for three or four days. So at the, the, my very last day, it was a dinner and she comes, she came up to me and she gives me her book and she says, I'm giving you this book and I wrote you a note, but read this when you get home and you're well rested because I, it was, it was a lot of fun. And we did, I did a lot while I was there. And so when I get home, I see her book, it's called women who impact. And she writes me this note and she says, I've been so inspired by what you have said over your last three days that I really think that your story should be told in my book publisher's next series, Women Who Illuminate. And so please read this book. And if you're interested, I would love to connect you with Kate Butler. And, and so I read the book. I was completely encouraged. And I thought, you know, if my story encouraged this one woman in Iowa that I'd never met before, maybe as a part of my self-healing, maybe I need to write my own story and maybe it can help others. And so with that connection, she introduced me to Kate Butler. Kate Butler took my story. She said, um, I don't want to make your story a chapter. I want to make it the forward of the book and women who illuminate. And so with that connection with Kate Butler, then I started going back to thinking, what what can I do now that I have this book out? And then um, a, a Barbie doll of Rosa Parks comes out. 
And when the Barbie doll comes out, it's absolutely beautiful Barbie doll, but it has a very limiting product description that then I go back and think, okay, I need to do something for the children so that they can know who the real Rosa Parks was. And so that's when I started talking to Kate Butler about a children's book. And, and, that's when and, and book. here we go yeah. is yeah. we're getting to this chapter. It's yes. a beautiful book. Uh, yes. I just uh, read it over the weekend and I recommend it to anybody. Uh, yes. Ordered on Amazon, had it the next day. And uh, you're going to be signing this for my granddaughter. Uh, so tell us now. Now tell us about this book, uh, which is only this next part of your journey. Yeah. Can, can so, I can I interrupt for a second? Yes, absolutely. I I, I, I don't want to gloss over the Rosa Parks part of your story. Um, when you when, when your uh, father-in-law died and you decided to pull together. All your experiences, your television marketing experiences, your media uh, communications experiences, along with your educational experiences, your educational degree, the, just the mindset of being an educator as opposed to a communicator, similar but not the same. When you decided to pull all those together, it was an opportunity not just to do a documentary about family history, let's interview a grandma before she dies and talk about uh, what it was like when she was, you know, during the Depression. This was an opportunity to tell the story of a civil rights icon that really became, I, you know, I can remember Rosa Parks. She was, she was in the news for a month. She was gone. She became two sentences in a history book. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, only Abraham Lincoln and George Washington get more than two sentences in a history <laughs> book, right? And and yet, you knew her through the family. Your father-in-law was a cousin. Yes. And so Cousin Rosie, who you wrote the book about, Cousin Rosie, <laughs> this is not just Cousin Rosie. This is the Rosa Parks civil rights icon. And nobody knew anything about her, as I described. You know, she... We know, we kind of know who she was. She seemed like, an, I remember the description. She seemed like a nice little lady, you know, meek little woman. Yes. All of a sudden, one day out of the blue, it seemed like. Yes. Gee, yeah. I, she wasn't going to move to the back of the bus. You know, now in the 1960s, that was a major crime in the South. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yet, when you told her story, and, and that's what I don't want to gloss over, right you recognize that there was more for people to know that Rosie, Rosa Parks wasn't, she may have been cousin Rosa to you, mm -hmm. but she was not just a little meek old lady who one day decided she wasn't going to move to the back of the bus. She was a, an activist and she, her personality was different in reading and watching the documentary. And, and, and which is really the adult version of yes. <laughs> Rosie. <laughs> Uh, but in watching the documentary, we really learned so much about Rosa Parks herself, the person, the woman, yeah. and uh, what she went through. That it wasn't just a happen, you know, a one day out of the blue, she wouldn't move to the back of the bus. She was a civil rights activist. Mm -hmm. She was not a loud screamer, yeller, protester. She was very quiet uh, and dignified, but yes. she paid a price for her activism. Uh, and never, she and her husband never worked again. They had to move to Detroit. They didn't even get to work in Detroit. Um, and you follow the rest of her life. I think it's a really important story. And what's important to your story, forgive me for going on. Oh, I love it. <laughs> but I, think no, I love you're getting it. You are getting it, John. This email yeah, I, makes I, a filmmaker happy. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I think what's important to your story is that you recognized when, when all this came together and you had this opportunity in front of you, you recognized that this was an important story. This wasn't just co Cousin Rosie. Mm -hmm. And you recognized that there was a whole lot to that story that people never knew about because that's the way the media works. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a famous civil rights icon, you get two lines in the history books, right? Mm -hmm. You recognized that the, that story needed to be told. You did a wonderful job. The documentary is terrific, by the way. And what's really good about it 
is it's historical. It's heartwarming because it's family story. But it tells the depth of civil rights from one person's perspective, the civil rights struggle. Yes. And, and boy, I think that's really important. And, and yes, of course, it's important for kids, too, because that's 50 years ago. Yes. And it's not something should be glossed over or forgotten um, or trying to be rewritten, as some people like to do with history. They won't want to rewrite history. Um, so I think that documentary for you was not just a turning point in your life. All of a sudden, now you're <laughs> you're not just a media person. You're not just an educator. You've made a documentary. But that was an important documentary. And I don't think people have... You've won a lot of awards um, with the film festival circuit and stuff. But I don't think that documentary has gotten enough attention. And I, I just wanted to wax poetic about it. So I have a quick question for you, um, uh, Angela. Uh, if for people who haven't seen the documentary and for people who uh, might be interested in um, uh, the book, the question I have for you is how can people find the documentary to see online or to order and uh, uh, how might they get a hold of the book? I think it's so much easier if you just go to Amazon and put in My Life with Rosie, not only will the documentary come up, but the book will come up as well. So they're both right there at your fingertips, right there. And I think um, by Amazon hosting the documentary and also hosting the book, it makes it so much easier for people just to learn more about Rosa Parks than what they read in their history books. And I mean, that's the whole reason why I did it. I mean, John pretty much, he just took all of my sound bites right out of my mouth because, <laughs> because I know I was feeling that way, John, because I was listening to these stories through family members, especially Aunt Carolyn. That's why I featured her because they had such a special relationship. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't remember, I don't remember hearing any of these stories and you know, okay, maybe not in elementary school, maybe not in high school history, but I took, I took a, quite a number of history classes, including some African-American history, where I didn't hear the depth of who Rosa Parks really was. And so I knew, that's why I'm so happy that I spent those years developing my craft as an educator, because I knew, you know, the filmmaking was there. I had the right crew. I mean, I went all back to my friends and they have the talents, but I knew as an educator, I knew I needed to tell that story that way because I was now given the opportunity to educate the masses and I was not going to take that for granted. Well, uh, I, I don't even know what the, 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 your, your next act is. Because <laughs> Uh, but you, you will be. We're going to have you back. I'm sure. I don't know for what yet, but we're definitely look forward to continue to speak to you and to continue to follow you on your journey. Uh, but as I, I, I uh, was referring to earlier on in uh, 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 in our conversation, is that you epitomize our audience, the Act Two generation, people who, uh, whether they're in the 40s or the 60s. Okay, we have stories of, uh, of people throughout the range of, uh, of their life, but particularly in their second act in the 50 plus kind of area, who think, well, you know, whatever I've done, I've done. Not true. And if you need a better example than Angela Williamson, I don't know who you're going to find. It's absolutely a fabulous story. And uh, I'm delighted that you shared it. I I've known enough of it. Every time we speak, I learn a little bit more. And uh, uh, it, you, you inspire. Thank you. Thank you. Any advice uh, to close out, Angela? Give us some advice for people, whatever their age, 40, 50, 60, who, who don't take advantage of those opportunities or think that they can't do something. You know, this is the advice, John, that I gave that actually uh, encouraged the lady in Iowa to give me that book and, and motivate me to write it, uh, to write in the next series. And I, I personally, it comes from me and my life's journeys. And so I always tell people, you know, what's, if you are telling yourself yes, 
you can ask people for anything because what's the worst that they can tell you? No, that's the worst. And so don't ever be afraid to ask because even if they may say no, tell yourself yes. And you can accomplish whatever goals or dreams that you set in front of you because that's the only word you need to hear is yes. Mm. Wonderful advice. Wonderful advice. Well, thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And uh, have a, have a con continued journey and have a great time because you obviously do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be on your show, Art and John. And I know we'll be doing another interview show together very soon. See you soon. <laughs> Good. 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 Yes, 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 definitely. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.